Good afternoon and welcome to Turning Pets into Cattle, the Stickiness of Data. My name is Chris Cannon. I'm with uh, Hewlett Packard Enterprise, working the cloud engineering team. Um, I'm Leong, I um, work for Intel, I'm a senior cloud architect. And my name is Gerd Prusman, I'm with Mirantis and the cloud solutions team. And the three of us are members of the enterprise working group here uh, for the OpenStack community. Uh, we are collaborating on this presentation today and one of our goals here is to uh, foster more participation from you. So when we get to the Q&A section, uh, we hope to be asking you questions so that we can help forge uh, enterprise community solutions uh, forward with, with future presentations and learnings. So with that, a couple of things about what this session is not about. First, it's not about CI, CD. Second, it's not about uh, deployment techniques or automation tools. Um, and third, it's not a discussion about agile development practices. All of those things are important, but we remain focused specifically on data and how it applies into uh, application architectures today. So our agenda for this session, uh, first we wanted to start off with a recap of a session that was delivered in Tokyo where we sort of teed up this conversation uh, to give you a little bit of history if you weren't there for that one. Then we'll jump into our discussion of data, and this is where we would really like your participation and assistance, talking about some of the challenges of, of data and moving it to a cloud world. Also, some of the strategies uh, off the top of our minds for possible ways of doing that, and we hope that you will help us there as well. And then at the end, we'll have this uh, Q&A session where we hope that we're asking you questions and you're providing answers. So with that, the recap, Dr. Soon. Thanks, um, thank you, Chris. So um, I'm Leon, as I mentioned just now. So uh, I just wanna give you guys a quick recap of what we have done in the last summit in Tokyo. So I have a co-presentation with um, uh, Stephen Wally, so from HPE. So we talk about um, turning pets into cattle, but during that presentation, we are focusing more on the web tier and the app tier so in this talk, we'll be focusing more on the data here. So I'll just give you guys a quick recap of what we have done last time. So in the last presentation, we talked about the differences between pets and cattle. So pets basically referring to the traditional conventional workload, and the cattle basically referring to more towards the cloud native or cloud oriented application. So if you're if you interested in that presentation, there's a references on, um, at the bottom of the link there. So you can just go to the link. And this pre presentation slide, we'll publish this online after the talk. So we can get a link there. And we also talk about uh, the differences between virtualization and cloud. So in the virtualization world, right, I mean, most of the structure that we use is more like a scale up model. It's a horizontal, it's a vertical scaling model. So we rely on the infrastructure for the resiliency. But in a cloud-based model, um, the application tends to be a very distributed model, distributed, distributed architectures, and it's a very horizontal scaling model. And the application itself, is designed to be responsible for their own resilience, resiliencies, agnostic or independent of the underlying infrastructures. So that's the key differences between virtualization and cloud. And we also talk about the design principle, the differences of the design principle between the conventional app and cloud-aware app. So I uh, also provide a link there, uh, published by the Open Data Center Alliance, talking about how do we architect cloud-aware applications. So these are some of the key um, uh, design principles that for conventional applications, that it tends to be monolithic, centralized state, but in the cloud-aware app, it's more distributed, you use microservices. And one of the key things is about this um, eventually consistent. So this is a very new concept uh, when compared to conventional applications. So in the previous talk, we talked about multiple strategies that how can we turn the tax applications into a cattle, a cloud native model. So basically what we suggest is um, look at your application, don't look at application as a whole when you want to migrate the app. To treat your application as a multiple components. So one of the strategy that we, oh sorry, so one of the strategy that we um, propose or suggest is 
you can actually move in the, in the conventional application, like con conventional models. You have your own web VM, web tier, and app tier. Those are in the VMs, right? You can migrate those VM as a whole to the cloud. That's fine. That's one strategy that you can adopt. And this strategy, the benefit for using this strategy is it doesn't require too much of re-architectures, but it doesn't give you the best benefit of the cloud features. So there's another strategy that we propose is actually, we suggest that it's actually using um, kind of like microservice model. So you, you treat your applications, a web tier or the app tier as a different subcomponents. So you only migrate certain components to the cloud and slowly one by one. And you can, and one of the example of in, in we use in the demo is we can actually host the static content. If you're using a three tier apps, right? You can actually host the static contents like this, uh, images or uh, HTML files or, or j uh, j JavaScript files in the cloud um, um, using uh, object storage. So these are three uh, different strategies that you can consider when migrating application from PATS model into, ca into Cato. Oops. So with that, um, today we are just we'll talk about the data tier, the data stickiness. So let's jump in, data stickiness. First, let's level set a little bit about some of the challenges that we face with data sets as they're utilized by applications, whether they're legacy applications or cloud native applications. They deal with the same set of data requirements in many cases. The first point is every pet is different. As we all know, the data set that they're using the way that they manipulate that data, how it's processed, is it ephemeral or static? Uh, the data sets are different for every sort of application. So every pet has its own unique uh, dependency on data. As such, there's some challenges in dealing with existing data sets. One of the largest problems from the technical side is how do we move data into the cloud? Um, you've got the technical aspect of it. Do we migrate it somehow through file copies or import export? Do we set up a replication scheme somehow? Do we make carbon copies of machines and set up a parallel environment uh, to be able to move this data? There are as many different possible paths to that as there are technologies available today. So this is an interesting technical challenge in uh, migrating data. The second piece is after you've done that, you need to ensure that your data is accurate. So there's a dependency on, on making sure that things are consistent and the integrity of the database still there. Depending on the migration path that you choose, you may encounter licensing problems. Perhaps you can't stand up a parallel system because of the unique licensing for the database technology that you're using. Also downtime. Copying large data sets requires a lot of time. Uh, perhaps your business, your organization, your customer doesn't have the luxury of, of being able to, to consume that much downtime. The second challenge is also about how we virtualize data as composed uh, to a, a typical uh, legacy sort of database uh, that we know and love today. Some of the things that you need to think about are the SLAs that are related to accessing this data. Uh, customers are concerned about data access policies that may be different in a cloud model. Uh, the performance, virtualized databases may not be as performant as your highly tuned uh, legacy enterprise class databases that you have as well. The uh, Recovery time objective and recovery point objective uh, data is really important as well for, for most enterprise SLAs, et cetera, et cetera. You, you can, there are many arguments uh, in multiple directions for the complexities of getting your data migrated. So this will be the first question that I'd like all of you to think about for the Q&A at the end of the presentation. Consider this with the customer years you're working with or the challenges you're facing today, the experience that you've had doing this to date. And at the end of the presentation, we would like to hear from you if we've missed something on this list, if there are items on this list that are more important than others, 
how can we as an enterprise working group help create uh, additional training collateral, reference documents, ways that we can help expose information so that we can all make this migration a little bit simpler. So we discussed that we would present three different options for possibly moving your data today. And uh, I'll take the first one, and it, it, at simple uh, explanation, it looks like the easiest one. I, I would offer that actually it's not necessarily any easier than the other two that you've seen, but there are some pros and cons to each of the options that we'll present this afternoon. The first being don't do anything with your data. Preserve your existing legacy database infrastructure. Uh, many businesses have made a significant investment in enterprise class databases. And uh, part of this is not just a reluctance to get off those things that they've been so comfortable with over the years, whether it's an administration, training, usability uh, focus, or whether it's a reliance on the types of SLAs that they get around using enterprise class database products. But I would offer that that you can also realize a less risky migration path by focusing on moving your applications to a cloud native platform first and then pulling your data along in a phase two approach so that you're mitigating the uh, migration risk to some extent. To support this, we're finding that most, uh, most applications and customers that are using a PaaS layer, uh, whether it's Cloud Foundry or, or most of the others, uh, those products have capability to connect to legacy databases easily. So there's no reason for customers to expect to have to port their data at the same time that they transform their legacy applications. The third data point that we've learned through, through our research here is that you can continue to leverage some of the capabilities that you have in your existing enterprise databases that might not necessarily be available or fully fleshed out or uh, at parity today with some of the cloud-based uh, database applications. And uh, Garrett will be covering some of those considerations in option two. So why should I move my database to the cloud? Um, probably because I want to benefit from the advantages um, the application guys um, <coughs> profit of. Um, I want to have horizontal scalability, for example, on-demand database instances, scalability and elasticity. And for this, I need a solution for the database on the cloud. This is one example how I could um, try to achieve that. Um, we picked one example here uh, with MySQL and the Galera library to have the opportunity to use scalability um, with a Galera cluster. Um, Galera offers you um, active master-master replication, and we have here the applications on top, cloud-native applications, scalable, horizontally, elastic, elast elastically scalable, and you need a load balancer to um, um, load balance the, the traffic from the application to the database, and then you could scale out the um, database cluster. Um, the advantage for the, for the um, project is that you know the technology, you know all the tools, uh, you know how to manage the, um, the database because you might already use it for your application anyway, for example, on-premise um, um, in the past. Um, you know all the operational tasks necessary to maintain the, the database, and um, the gap between the old technology and the new one is very, very low. Um, and it brings you the scalability that you want to have on the cloud. But there are some limitations on the other hand as well. So for example, um, you need explicitly um, uh, primary keys on, your, on all your tables, the update on schemas is different, um, and some other limitations as well, like it's only um, possible on the InnoDB um, database engine. But um, not, all not all engines are available, but at least with this subset you could work. 
um, the operational tasks remain, so there is no automation. You have the scalability, you could scale out the cluster, you could provision new instances, but you have to do it by yourself. It's a manual task. So obviously it's not the level of automation that you um, probably will, uh, you are looking for on the cloud. Um, all the automation efforts that are necessary to automate it have to be done by yourself. Another option could be to use um, the OpenStack project Trove, which is in fact database as a service. It provides you with a, with a self-service to, um, to provision your own database instances. Um, it's a very easy on-demand database um, consumption and it offers you a lot of databases as of today. Um, for example, Cassandra, MongoDB, MySQL, and a lot of others. Um, the advantage, advantage of Trove for you would be that it would automate a lot of the tasks that are necessary to deploy the database, maintain the database, um, make backups from the database, and all the different and various tasks. Um, in fact, not all of these databases are currently considered as um, stable in conjunction with Trove um, because the data store that is used um, for the databases is only considered stable for MySQL currently and on a technical preview level for Cassandra and MongoDB. And all the others are considered as ex experimental. And the whole project is on a not very major, uh, um, uh, on a not very major uh, level from my point of view. It's considered as a very, very young project. But on the other hand, it offers you a lot of um, functionality. So there are currently some gaps and limitations with respect to the um, self-provisioning services and all the, the, the functionality that it delivers to you. We compiled a short list of um, functionalities uh, that are fulfilled by, um, that we consider as major in, uh, with Trove. Um, but for example, some of the operational tasks that you are required to do are not very major. So for example, push button compute scaling, um, that is not automatically done. Um, it requires you to intervene manually. The same with the migration to a new database. And that's normally something that you would expect from the cloud autom automated cloud environment that it does it for you. Um, it requires an external backup solution. There is a backup possibility um, with respect to Swift, but um, it, not, it delivers not all the functionality you would expect from a, from a full-blown backup, um, backup uh, software. Um, in case that you are required to change your database engine, then it's a good idea to have a close look to your application. We did this, for example, for WordPress. WordPress is a well-known software and um, it uses a very MySQL-centric code base. So what would be necessary to use another database, for example, NoSQL database? Um, then, in fact, you have to fork the application and introduce all the functionality again and refactor it for a new database. And that's a lot of effort needed. That's a lot of costs um, because you have to maintain these fork in the future as well. So if there is a new functionality in the application, you have to... Um, develop these, this functionality on your fork for, for your database as well. Um, you could introduce an abstraction layer for the databases, for all databases, but that needs a lot of time, uh, work as well. So it would be required to invest a lot of uh, work and money in this, uh, in this task. Um, the other possibility would be to have a full database abstraction layer. It's again a lot of work that needs to be done to achieve this. So it depends on your application and the database that you currently use if the two options are um, possible for you or viable options. Okay, so the third option that we would like to talk about here is um, migrating or converting um, RDBMS into NoSQL. So before we do that, right, we always have to ask ourselves one question why do I need to migrate from RDBMS to NoSQL? Is there such a need for us to do so or not? So I think there's nothing wrong with um, RDBMS, right? So, but the thing is, is, in today's world, I mean, most of the new use cases coming out, right, if you're mobile applications, 
you're doing big data stuff, you're doing um, um, IoT stuff. Um, the architecture is widely distributed. It's a very, very widely on horizontal scaling architectures. And we have to deal with a lot of structures as well as unstructured data. But those unstructured data is just not satisfied. I mean, just not, you just can't meet those requirements if you're continu continuing using the RDBMS system. If you are coming into that situation whereby you need to support those use cases, that will be the point whereby you need to consider should I re-architect my applications uh, the data tier layer from RDBMS into NoSQL. And of course, um, if you're still um, focusing on those um, OLTP transactions and structured data or very concerned about the ACID model or the traditional models, then that might not be a good choice for you to move into NoSQL. So it all depends on your applications. So, um, okay, so when you talk about migrating uh, RDBMS to NoSQL, right, um, there are some other things that you have to be aware of because in the RDBMS system, um, basically you have to design the schema and you run a lot of uh, different SQL query, stop procedures, um, but in no SQL, you basically don't do those things anymore, right? Generally, you don't do those things anymore. And the, the way that we model the data, the data modeling will be different as well. In the RDBMS, so everything is modeled being like two dimensions of data, right? Like a row and columns of data. But in the um, NoSQL, you talk about key values things, you're talking about um, document space, so those data modeling will be totally different. So if you're considering migrating to NoSQL, you have to look about how we, we have to change the way that we model the data. And uh, other things like um, integration. If you're integrating your applications in the RDBS model, you, we run a lot of, we ask you a lot of different SQL query. You do a select, you do an update, you do all those things. But when it comes to NoSQL, those are, no longer valid for use, right? So you basically have to build that into your application doing like a db.insert, db.update, something like that. So that's a totally different model. And of course, when you're migrating to NoSQL, the concept of foreign key might gone. So you might not have, no, you, it, when you do the data modeling, all those things, the foreign key might not be exist anymore. And definitely the no ACID, the ACID model is gone. And in the NoSQL, the basically the model tends to move towards the idea about eventually consistent. I'm not sure you guys heard about the CAP theorem in a distributed application, the distributed architectures. Consistency, um, availability, and partition tolerance. The concern about this CAP, right, I mean, in a distributed application, you can only choose two of them. You can't achieve three at all. You, can, you cannot achieve three at the same time. You either have consistencies, availability, and sa sacrifice the partition tolerance. And in a NoSQL model, they tend to move on towards um, availability and partition tolerance. So that's why this, uh, we have this concept about eventually consistent. So you are, you are not always getting, the, the, the database, right, you're not, you might not be always getting the same data at the same time, but eventually you will get consistent. So that's a new concept about moving into no SQL. Um, so if you, re, um, if you really want to migrate into no uh, SQL, right, there are a few migration tactics that we can consider here. So one thing is, how do we move, I mean, how, how do we move the data from RDBMS to um, no, no SQL, for example, Mo MongoDB? You can build your own script to retrieve all your database data and then port it into the um, no SQL database. You can use some of the ETL tools that you can use. And some of them, actually, uh, they actually consider using Hadoop. So they actually run a Hadoop clusters and Hadoop using some Hadoop um, mechanism to retrieve the data from your RDBMS systems and then use Hadoop to do the processing and then put them into the NoSQL database. And another strategy that you can, uh, people consider is um, do a snapshot and do an incremental transfer. And another thing that I want to talk more about is this application-driven model. So what I mean by application-driven model is, uh, one thing, keeping the data in both RDBMS and NodeSQL concurrently during the transition period. So when, when you're migrating the application during the transition period, right, you just have, your application just have to write two things. One write to the RDBMS, and also at the same time write to the NoSQL. So you're keeping two data at the same time. And the second, op and, and in fact, this op these options, I mean, these tactics have been used by a lot of companies today. And another thing is what I call on-demand. So when I mean on-demand, right, basically what I mean is your applications, right, for example, if you want to read uh, a data from, uh, an image data, okay, you first read from NoSQL, the new database that you're porting to, the NoSQL, and if that data doesn't exist in that 
NoSQL, right? Your application logic has to be built to, uh, can be built to consider fallback to the old database. And then when you fall back to the old database, you copy that data to the NoSQL on demand and then return the result to the users. So that's the second option. But of course, these options, right, you involve more transaction time because you're basically reading the, you first try to read from the new database first and it's not found there and try to read from the old database and it might um, copy that data over to the new database and then return the data to the users. So that's the second tactic that people can use, can consider using that. Of course, it all depends on your use cases, what is your application. And these are the few tactics that we um, put up here and for your considerations. Yeah, to summarize what we, what we um, provided until now, <coughs> you need to understand your pet applications, have a look at the source code, the options with respect to the databases and the different models. Um, some technologies that you already know probably with the, with the old applications and the old databases are available on the cloud. Some are not, so they need replacement. And this has um, consequences for the management and the operation of the database or the schema or the technologies that you use. Um, there are different design principles with respect to SQL and NoSQL. You have to take this into consideration as well. And um, there is a transformation necessary to, from the traditional culture to the cloud culture with respect to the technologies and the processes um, that, you, uh, that are required. And your devs, dev teams and operation teams need the skill set to change either the application or the schema or the technologies or maintain and operate, operate all these technologies. Um, with this, I would like to ask you what are your experiences with the data migration or migration of data and databases to the cloud? We have a microphone up here. For those of you that have experience you'd like to share, please do so. Hello, yeah, I've got an uh, interesting use case. I, I work as a workflow analyst in research science computing. We've just adopted OpenStack, and the pet's problem I have is that our researchers basically deal with really large collections of flat files. They're like 55,000 images, for example, of earth science um, models and things like that. And so we have, and they're very uh, attached to them, just like your pet's analogy here. So we're trying to figure out the best way, a combination with uh, Ceph and OpenStack of, of figuring out the best way to manage that as we go forward. And I'm, I don't know, uh, we don't have the answer yet, but the best I can do is come up with an idea where we have uh, physical hardware in the middle to handle the, the computational side of the workflow. And then on the pre-processing and post-processing side, um, have persistent storage on either end of that that we bridge into the middle which might be ironic or however we do that. I'm not, we haven't really figured it out yet, but that's our use case. And I don't know if you have any observations on that, but it's, it's a tricky one because it's really uh, orthogonal to your example of the uh, RDBMS kind of idea. But it's another one out there. <laughs> Thanks. I work for Rackspace, and as part of one of the projects, we had to move data from um, Postgres database into a MySQL database. Uh, we're using Mongo. And one of the requirements we had was uh, there are two different applications. And at the end of the day, we had a legacy application uh, that was removed to the new application. They both need to have the access to the same data. One of the key requirements we had was uh, users using both the system, they need to be able to see data in both the systems. So one of the biggest challenges we had was we tried a two-way sync that copies data from uh, MongoDB into the Postgres database, and that was the biggest pain we had. So I think in, in, in these cases, the customer and the business requirements, they dictate what kind of strategies we need. And moving data from NoSQL to a relational database, that was the, the biggest pain we had. So basically moving from NoSQL to to, uh, my, to MySQL, Postgres. My, Postgres, MySQL. And we had to do yeah. a two-way sync. Yeah, so because some of users, the applica new applications is reading that one, and right. they also need to read it all. Right, so we had users on both the, both the applications, yeah. and the, given, the criticality of, uh, given the criticality of the application, we could not do a fast cutover or hard cutover, mm -hmm. so we had to do transition over a period of time. The system was in beta for some time, but we had to make sure that we could support both the systems. 
Yeah, as we mentioned, just now, every application has different characteristics, right? So you, ha you really have to understand what your data is and what is the best strategy for you to consider. I'm curious. Uh, did you need to move it to the traditional Postgres in order for your customer to adopt a transactional model? Or, or what, what, was, what was the pull that, that brought you to have to do that? So the legacy application was built a long time ago. Sorry, can we, can we speak to the mic? Because I'll try to record the sessions. So the legacy application was built a long time ago. It was built on relational database using uh, old technologies. In the new system we're building, we had to move to a cloud application, cloud, basically run everything in the cloud. We didn't want to spend, um, we didn't want to use uh, RDBMS. The new system we were building need to have flexibility for making changes in the future. So instead of doing RDBMS, relational, we decided to go with NoSQL. Hey, um, so I work for uh, Solid Power, now part of NetApp, um, but in a previous lifetime, I've done most of the things that you discussed and encountered the, ch the challenges there. And in moving from a traditional DBMS to NoSQL, uh, what we found with our application architecture as we were, we were having explosive uh, scale growth at that time, um, and, and during that transition, we moved to a service-oriented architecture because that was actually, that was a data-driven decision because as we moved out of the DBMS, out of MySQL, we found that there was a subset of data that truly needed to exist there. That's where it made the most sense. This is user file information. And so we made a, a basically a user file service that um, remained uh, responsible and was the access, the web access point for that particular you know, piece of data. Whereas the event information and all the geographic locality information um, for, for tracking eventing um, was moved into Mongo. And you know, so, the, so the bulk of the data moved into, the ob, you know, into this kind of uh, uh, document store and you know, uh, kind of cloud-enabled uh, you know, type of structure um, because it actually it was all JSON data. It made the most sense to, to put the, there rather than you know, sticking it in a blob in a traditional data store. Whereas the, the, you know, the, the user file stuff that we've been doing for decades you know, user accounts, information like that, just it deserved to remain in the DBMS because that's where it made the most sense. So we just simply uh, architected the service architecture around those two different needs, used the right tool for the job. Um, for the migration pattern, um, we used a live migration, we used a, uh, a shunt method, um, and then a backfill, a verification backfill to make sure that all the ideas had been transferred over. So that took like, you know, a week or so to move uh, many, many terabytes of data, but that's how we accomplished that, so. Thank you. Thank you. Great observations. Anyone else? We still have time. We thought we would uh, put this information slide up in the background so you could take notes, write some things down. Uh, our OpenStack Enterprise Working Group uh, has a mailing list. We have regular, uh, regular calls we'd invite you all to participate in. Of course, as you think deeper about the questions we're asking here and and some of this uh, subject matter, we would love to hear your experience. Um, and thank you for, for those of you that have shared your experience so far. So others, do you please use the microphone? I'm just uh, kind of curious about what type of support models that you have for um, using uh, databases inside of OpenStack, but yet, um, you know, usually inside of an enterprise, you have the OpenStack team, and then you also have uh, a database team that handles pretty much everything else. So I'm kind of curious um, what your all's experience has been in order to actually provide, um, you know, a homegrown solution to transition, to get additional teams to support the databases that the OpenStack um, is going to be using, so. Really good point. Um, I, I think you'll find that uh, in the network space, you might see the same sort of challenge, right? Where, you, where you're adjusting your, your staffing for your cloud administration to adopt the practices that oftentimes were broken out to a specific uh, team or tactical unit. But uh, I think that's a fabulous topic for a future presentation. So uh, anyone have an answer for this guy? 
your own experience? I know there's a couple of sessions, um, one that I heard earlier today that you might be interested in around supporting OpenStack Cloud that they did talk a little bit about the challenge of, of moving from uh, a, a dedicated support team that was deeply focused on things like databases or networking, et cetera, to, to a more holistic, cloud-centric, uh, more of a breadth support team. If you have uh, ideas for topics that you'd like to hear about in Barcelona, please send your ideas to this list as well, and uh, we'll try and take your feedback and, and prepare for uh, round three. Please. At, at, at the risk of being verbose and talking twice, to answer the previous question, um, having made the transition from a traditional operations environment and database administration environment um, to transforming my own skill set as well as hiring a team of ops people and turning them into DevOps people, that was a similar experience that was along uh, the same time frame as, uh, as the transition I talked about earlier with the migration. We went from a traditional monolithic architecture, vertical architecture, to a horizontal architecture. And in doing so, we had to um, stretch and make uncomfortable the operations folks who had a few gray hairs on their heads like myself, as well as bring in the more operationally inclined development guys who really wanted to get into the guts of the system. So we created a DevOps team by bringing in folks from both the old school and the new school um, to kind, kind of uh, you know, create and, and transform into a DevOps team that could manage a, a breadth of environment. And we did uh, specific cross-pollination exercises to, to increase the breadth of people's skill sets because it becomes more of, of a matter of uh, knowing where to go to find out the answer rather than having everything in your head for a specific uh, area of expertise. You, you have to be quick and swift and be able to move back and forth and track it down quickly. Um, but that was my experience with that. Was there any resistance among your operations team? Yes. I mean, that, that there, there was. Yes, and some of them didn't make the jump to the head of the team. They changed that to adapt to the head of the team. All right. I think we are at the end of our time allotment. So uh, on, on behalf of my distinguished colleagues and I, thank you so much for your time. Thank you for remaining here. Thank so, you for um, your feedback. So we, um, the Enterprise Work Group, we published two e-books. So we talk about what is OpenStack, why OpenStack, and the second book talk about how to implement OpenStack in your enterprise company. It's fully available. It's, we have printed copy here. So Foundation printed a couple of copies here. You can come and get it if you want. And there's also an e-book version. If you need an e-book version, just reach out to us. Thanks, everybody. Enjoy the rest of the Thank conference. You.